Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The 2014 legislative session begins in days. We preview the big issues facing lawmakers in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The gavel to reconvene the 88th legislature will drop at noon on Tuesday, February 25th. See that that a tradition leading up to the start of session so includes like the four legislative leaders Steele facing the media to discuss their legislative priorities. Like the Caucus leaders the sat down with us board. as well. Senate Majority Leader Tom Bach joins me now to preview the 2014 legislative session. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Happy to be with you. Let's begin with some of the key issues coming facing 2014. At the beginning of the 2013 session, you stood with several other senators and unveiled the top four legislative priorities for your caucus. One of those that did not make it through conference committee last year is minimum wage. Where do you anticipate that going? How quickly do you anticipate that getting out of conference committee this year? Well, we, uh, we did pass the bill, and the, the House didn't convene the conference committee until the last day of session, so we kind of ran out of time. But uh, I, think, uh, I think it would be safe to say we're, we're going to put a minimum wage on the governor's desk before the Easter break. So $2 uh, differential, do you think your caucus will, will go up to 9 something an hour, or do you think the House is going to have to come down to roughly seven fifty an hour? Well, uh, the Senate's at seven seventy five for large employers. The House is at nine fifty. Uh, I, I think all the action is really around something that nobody has talked about, and that is what is the appropriate minimum wage for smaller businesses? Because when you get uh, outside of the Twin Cities, you've got a lot of smaller businesses, and that's where we're sensing a lot of the opposition is, is on main streets and small rural towns. So I think we've got to find, uh, find a sweet spot. Uh, I think the 950 for large businesses is less problematic than uh, I think what really matters is probably what's the number going to be for Minnesota small businesses? How are they going to be impacted? Okay, Senator. Also, one of the initiatives that was brought up, one of the proposals was yours, and it was to to require a supermajority vote for ballot initiatives. Is this something you're going to move forward with this year? That was Senate File 4. Uh, we actually, I believe, have that scheduled for a hearing in the State and Local Government Committee on March 3rd, I believe. So. Uh, we're going to send it, uh, I assume it's going to pass out of there. I talked with Senator Hand today about finding bipartisan support for that. I noticed one of his senators actually is the chief author of a bill to do the same thing. So I think we're going to find some bipartisan support if we have that. I'm very reluctant to pass something off the floor of the Senate with only Democrats votes. But if we can find a bipartisan vote uh, for that bill, I, uh, right now today, uh, I think we probably likely will send that over to the House and have them think about it. Another proposal that made it to the Senate floor, almost made it to, to a vote for final passage, but it, it stalled, is the anti-bullying bill, also known as the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Do you anticipate that coming up quickly, sooner rather than later? Well, I, I'd like to find some uh, bipartisan agreement on that. I'm, I'm not sure we have that yet. I met with the minority leader about six weeks ago. That's one of the issues we talked about. Uh, he said he had some caucus members that are interested in being engaged in the conversation about that. Uh, I, I don't know if we're going to get there or not. I do think we will, the House has passed a bill, Senate uh, will take it up and pass something. I don't know how much different our bill is from the House, uh, but I do think something will end up on the governor's desk on that. I, I think the big question is what does it cost? And uh, I know the Minnesota School Board Association is very concerned about the bill they put a multi-million dollar price tag on it. Uh, so, you know, we're, I think as a legislator, I've always been a little bit concerned about unfunded mandates when we tell schools or local governments that they have to do things, and then we never send them the, funny be the funding because the ultimate default of that is ends up falling on the property tax. And because schools have nowhere else, nowhere else to go for the money, if they can't can get from the state, then they got to get it off local property taxpayers. So I think we've got to get the, the school board association involved too, and try to hit the spot where it's not overly burdensome from them, uh, or we have to be willing to put state money in uh, to, uh, to fund it. Senator, a reoccurring issue, Sunday liquor sales. We're expecting it to come up again. It's likely anyway in the House. Rep uh, Republican Assistant Major Minority Leader, excuse me, Jennifer Loon is, is also 
offering up a proposal on Sunday liquor sales. Does it have bipartisan support or enough support to pass at this point, in your opinion? You know, that issue's been around a long time, and, and I think it's going to be very hard to pass as long as the, the, the liquor industry remains against it. Uh, the on-sale or the off-sale liquor industry, the liquor stores that people go to, aren't asking for this. Uh, the tap rooms are, which is the difference at this point. There is some within the liquor industry who's starting to push for it. The, 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 the only place I've sent support for it in, are in some of the border cities, towns like Moorhead, Duluth, Winona, uh, maybe Stillwater, where they were on the border with a neighboring state that allows it. Uh, what I have heard over and over over the years, and this isn't a new issue, is from from small liquor stores, especially um, municipals, and we have a lot of municipal liquor stores in the state that local governments run, is it doesn't increase sales any. All it increases is labor cost, and it increased labor costs significantly. When, uh, you know, and, and the argument, the counter is, well, they don't have to be open, but if your competitor down the street is open, you're kind of forced to be open. So, uh, you know, it increased labor costs by, you know, instead of being open six days, you're gonna be open seven. So if that doesn't generate additional sales, uh, that reduces profit margins. So much like selling cars, you know, we don't uh, allow cars to be sold on Sundays either. So okay. it's, an, it's old history to it. I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize for the sake of time. Let's go to business to business taxes. Do you support a repeal of any of these? Uh, I understand that there's th the Senate's being very cautious. They want to wait until the February forecast before really diving into tax issues. But do you support them if, if the finances are in place? Well, it would depend on, on how much money is in the surplus because it's about more than just the cost of doing it this year. Because once you take that revenue away, it gets taken away both years in the next biennium. So it costs twice as much in the next biennium to repeal them as it does in this one. Uh, the, the, the thing I have serious concern over is the Senate is not on the ballot this year. We will be here a year from now putting a new state budget together. And I don't want to overcommit on the spending side or on the tax cut side. Uh, only to find ourselves a year from now in a situation where we're facing another deficit, potentially might have to borrow again from schools or use other uh, accounting measures. So I think we're going to be a little careful. I think generally the Senate feels that the surplus money, for the most part, and I'm not saying we're not going to do some new spending or some tax reductions, uh, but for the most part we're going to use it on one-time uses. Uh, that don't have uh, costs in the next biennium. Okay, Senator, it's a bonding year. Would you support a billion dollar bonding bill? You know, I know that's what the governor's come out with, but the four leaders actually uh, entered into an agreement at the end of session last year that we would only bond for a billion dollars for the biennium. Uh, we did about 156 million last year, so there's room for about 845 million in a bonding bill based on the handshake agreement that uh, we have. I intend to uh, keep my word to Senator Han on that. What I have talked with Senator Han about, is there a way to enhance the bonding bill by using some of this surplus cash that we have? And uh, he, as early as, as recently as today, said that he's got caucus members that are interested in using some cash uh, to increase the bonding number. So I, I think it's possible we're going to spend a billion dollars on bonding. I just think some of it will be on capital investment, some of it will be bonding, some of it's likely to be cash. Okay, and Senator, um, as we enter into this session, just kind of, if you can, describe to me the tone of your caucus moving in. Is it? You're talking about handshake agreements that you're willing to respect. Is that kind of the tone you're taking in with you? Well, I, I think that this, you know, the Senate's different than the House. We've got four-year terms. Uh, I think in the Senate, uh, both the Republican and the Democrat caucuses, we're not staring down the barrel at an election coming up uh, this November. So, I, and when that's the case, you generally find the Senate uh, to be to talk about a little bit. Uh, a little bit of less about election year politics and doing things that uh, are connected somehow to the election. So I think we're going to continue to move forward on what I like to describe as good government uh, positions and and probably a little less partisan rancor than the House has. Okay, Mr. Majority Leader, as always, a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. To discuss the 2014 legislative session on behalf of his caucus, we have Senate Minority Leader David Hand. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Good to be with you. We're going to go through several of the key issues that were expected to be are expected to be taken up this session. Let's begin with minimum wage. 
two proposals currently in conference committee. What is your caucus strategy if and when a final pack package makes it to the Senate well, floor? Well, one of my predictions this year is that we will see an increase in minimum wage. I know I'm going out on a limb to make that bold prediction, but we think that uh, both the majorities in the House and the uh, Senate passed last year an increase. Uh, they are not in agreement yet. On our side, in our caucus, we think that uh, uh, conforming to the federal minimum wage standard, which is a 40 percent increase from where we are right now, is probably prudent. Uh, it matches what Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, the Dakotas have, so it put us uh, in the same place as our surrounding states. But we're very concerned about elevating that too high. It does have an economic impact. A uh, recent uh, uh, federal report that was released uh, establishes that there's, there could be significant job loss if you push that minimum wage too high. I had a meeting just last week with the uh, uh, nursing home providers, nursing care providers, and uh, they say that they cannot afford to have a huge minimum wage pushed, pushed onto them, and they will need to have additional uh, financing from the state if that happens, and that makes sense because they're dependent on us for income. But the other businesses in the public that get forced into a high minimum wage, what do they do? They have to raise prices, they have to uh, find the wages other places, cut benefits from existing employees, other things. It, it just is, needs to be cautiously done. Okay, Senator, the Safe and Supportive Schools Act, also known as the anti-bullying bill. Senate Majority Leader Tom Bach was on the show and he stated he's looking for some bipartisan support if this is to move forward. Will he get any? Well, yes, and, and I have talked with him about this and we think that something of this uh, size should be done in a bipartisan way. I think the current bill that is being uh, offered on the floor is doesn't have any support from not only Republicans, but the School Board Association opposes it 100 percent. I've talked to dozens of school districts around the state, none of them uh, like the bill that's on the floor, they don't believe they need it. And I think we need to have a bill that reflects the, uh, the, the realities that school districts have elected representatives that work with their public and with the students, and we should trust them a little more than what this bill apparently does. And I think there is a good compromise that we can reach. Sunday liquor sales, Senator Roger Reiner carrying the bill in the Senate. Jennifer Loon, the deputy minority leader, carries the bill in the, in the House. Her language essentially gives it up, gives the, the power to local municipalities to decide whether or not to open up Sunday liquor sales. Does that language have any support with your caucus? Is it even a caucus position? We have talked about it uh, not a lot in our caucus. There are some members that are in favor of a change in the law, others that are opposed to it. I, I don't think we're going to have a caucus position on something like that. We don't see that it's going to be a huge issue this year. Uh, it may come up, I'm not sure. Uh, and when it does, uh, we'll see what the votes are, but it's not something that we're going to be pushing our members to go one way or the other on. It's likely there could be a repeal of the business to business taxes. It is likely they'll be looked at regardless of whether or not they are repealed. But is there any tax reform your caucus would like to push? Anything that could realistically make it through? Well, we think that that should be a priority for the session, and we certainly support that going back to last year's special session. We think all three of those taxes should be repealed, and we think we can do that. We hope we have support from the majorities. Uh, but beyond that, we think there's uh, federal conformity on deductions that we should look at. Uh, I've heard some other ideas that we should look at in our tax code. I don't know that we're in a position to do a full overhaul of our tax code, but we can do some things that would be helpful to the economy and serve the purpose of returning some of the excess money we've collected in the surplus back to taxpayers who paid it, and this is one way to do it. The bonding bill, again, going back to our interview with Senator Box, he says there is a handshake agreement to try to keep that bonding bill to a billion dollars over the course of two years as opposed to a uh, billion dollars moving into 2014. What if there's a push by the governor? to move this number up. Is that something you'd consider? Well, no, I don't think so, unless there were significant uh, offers by the governor to help uh, do some things that maybe the Republicans want to do. But the, the reality is to do a bonding bill, you need bipartisan support, as it should be. We're putting the state into debt, and so you need to have a higher threshold of votes. And we did have a, an agreement last year to keep the total bonding over the course of the biennium to be a billion dollars. We did some things for capital restoration last year. And so I think that does put an effective limit on how big the bonding bill can be this year. We'd like to see the priorities be infrastructure, transportation, things of that sort. And so there's going to be some negotiation on that. But at the end of the day, we do support the, the bonding bill to that level. And uh, we hope that the governor will uh, come around to our side. Would you support surplus cash being used for any building projects? Well, I think at this point, we're, uh, we're, we're, we think that the, the surplus, is so-called, should be returned to taxpayers. We don't, uh, we don't need them. Uh, we've collected them in excess of what our needs are. And because we have these tax issues that are out there, we ought to use that excess money to, to make sure we can return that in a, in a tax change. Senator Minshore, still an issue with your caucus in particular, and so do you expect to get any hearings on any particular proposals to try to change or, or 
reestablish Minshore? Well, we are going to try. We think there are some things that we could do and should do to uh, improve the current governing process, for example. The board needs, I think, stronger governance uh, by the legislature. I think we need to do some things on uh, what powers they may have. We don't think they ought to be uh, allowed to do active purchasing, so-called. Uh, that just limits more choices for consumers. We think this, this rollout has been nothing short of a disaster, and we think that we ought to be much more cautious about going forward. Uh, you see the federal government uh, just uh, sort of unilaterally deciding not to implement portions of this law. I think we should be more cautious in Minnesota about what works for Minnesotans, and I don't think that the current structure is working. So there are going to be some things that we will offer. We don't know whether or not they'll get a hearing, but we're going to try. Senator, as session begins, it's only days away, how would you categorize or classify the tone of your caucus moving forward? Well, we're optimistic. We, we think that uh, the public has been hearing a lot of things from the Democrats and observing what they have done on the other side, and we think that uh, uh, from our perspective, I think the public is kind of scratching their heads. Why did we raise the taxes so much? Why did we do the spending so much? Why are we pursuing these things like daycare unionization? Why did we do this minsure thing that's turned out to be such a debacle? So from our side, we think it helps us make the argument that there is a better, more prudent way to govern, and we look forward to having a House majority of Republicans next election. Okay. Senator David Han, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Yep. And here to provide her caucus perspective on the 2014 legislative session, we have House Majority Leader Erin Murphy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay, let's begin with the minimum wage issue. It's the same bill or the same proposal I've spoken to the other leadership about. Mm -hmm. And do you see, do you anticipate some compromise as this heads into conference committee? You know, there's about a $2 differential between the House and the Senate bills at this point. Well, I do think that, uh, you know, that's the point of a conference committee is to come together and look at the proposals from the House and the Senate and find a path forward. So that's its intention. You know, I really hope that we're able to stay close to that $950 uh, rate, especially as we've seen uh, more and more data come up out about um, what a minimum wage is, what a living wage is, what it means um, to work full time and earn a salary that supports your family. Um, you know, I hope that we're able to stay close to that number, but that's going to be left to the conference committee and the work that they do. Uh, I do anticipate that we'll get something done soon and uh, uh, to the governor's desk early in the session. That's my hope. Let's talk a little bit about the bonding bill. Do you support a billion dollar bonding bill? Uh, Senate Majority Leader Tom Bach said there's kind of a handshake agreement to stay within that billion dollar range between the two years, leaving about $850 million for this session. Is that something that your caucus holds to as well? You know, I think uh, it is important for us to consider what we need to do for the state of Minnesota. That should be our first priority. And uh, there are a lot of infrastructure needs and many more that have come um, through the Capital Investment Committee process than we're going to be able to handle this year. Um, so, you know, I know that uh, we'll probably get within that range of 850 to a billion dollars uh, for this session and we'll consider all those options, uh, all those projects. Uh, but again, our guiding principle, sh principle should be what is in uh, Minnesota's best interest as we move forward. And so to that point, would you support using surplus cash instead of going through the bonding process? I think that's an option for us to consider, uh, but one that you know we'll, we'll consider as we move through the session. Speaking of surplus cash, we don't know the February forecast at this point, however, if it comes in with a, a, a fair chunk of surplus mm -hmm. cash, would you support tax relief over increased spending? You have PCAs looking for a 5% increase. You have early childhood educators hopefully hoping for a bit more funding as well. Where do you stand on this? Well, it's never an either or, right, in terms of one choice or the other. Uh, we passed a, a structurally balanced budget uh, last session uh, for the first time, I think, in a decade. One that really balances not only into this biennium, but into the next biennium, which is really good news for Minnesotans. Um, and the other good news for Minnesotans is the economy continues to recover. And we have to pay attention because it's not recovering in the same way all across the state of Minnesota. So we've got work left to do to make sure everybody's experiencing um, the benefits of, of a, a, an economy that is in recovery. Uh, but I do think uh, if there is a surplus, as many anticipate there will be, and I always cross my fingers till we get to the day of the forecast, uh, our members are going to want to take a look at some of the B2B taxes that were passed last session and reconsider those. Um, and I also think that, uh, you know, we have heard a lot from especially people who take care of people uh, with disabilities who are aging and need a little extra help. Um, those people that do that kind of work 
uh, have been uh, really making a case about uh, making sure that they get a little bit more of a salary increase and we'll probably consider that as well. You mentioned the B2B taxes. Do you anticipate any other forms of tax relief that you might push for? I think that we're going to look at the budget, uh, you know, that we passed. Uh, I think that should stay intact. Um, uh, I know that there's interest on the B2B taxes. I know there are some that are talking about tax conformity um, and making sure that we continue to conform with the federal government, and I think that's a possibility as well. But as I've said to a lot, especially our first-term members, we have a structurally balanced budget, and it is a, a, an important uh, foundation on which to build, and we have to be careful to maintain that, right? So. Um, just because there is some surplus revenue um, that we didn't anticipate doesn't mean that um, we should consider that uh, a harbinger for the future and um, start spending in a way that isn't going to protect the, the balance of that budget for now. So, Madam Leader, let's talk about Sunday liquor sales. It's an issue that comes up quite often. It does. Senator Roger Reiner is carrying it in the Senate, and now Representative Jennifer Loon, the Deputy Minority Leader, she's got a bill in the House. Hers would essentially pro allow municipalities to decide whether or not to, to allow for Sunday liquor sales. Do you think that language can gain some support for that proposal? It, it may. Um, I also think that would create quite a patchwork across the state of Minnesota. Um, uh, so, you know, it could. Uh, there's a lot of energy around this issue right now. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how much that is translating into uh, member support or if they're changing their position on the issue. Fundamentally, this is an issue for our small businesses. Uh, I represent, uh, in the district where I live, a number of small business owners that uh, have liquor stores that are closed on Sundays. And uh, so they're asking us to consider what it means in terms of their competition against a larger um, Costco or Sam's Club or Target. Um, and I think we should consider that. Um, but we should also consider what it means for a family or a person who has to drive to um, Wisconsin to buy a six pack of beer before a football game because they were unable, weren't able to get to the liquor store on Saturday. So I, I think there's a question there for us to consider, obviously. Um, I'm glad that people are coming up with uh, a variety of solutions that makes our decision making a little um, more informed, a little easier. And we'll see what happens. Okay, my last question for you is, heading into session, what kind of tone is your caucus going to use as, as you move forward? You know, there's been a lot of talk about some bipartisan issues like the 5% PCA increase. Mm -hmm. Is there kind of a sense of trying to work in a bipartisan capacity or is it really just these are our issues, we're going to move forward come what may? Well, I think that um, Minnesotans uh, like when we're able to work uh, bipartisanly and geographically across the state of Minnesota, so that's always my objective. Um, but it takes two to tango, right? So um, it is clear that we're going to work um, to pass a minimum wage, and I, I would love to see um, Republican support for that. Um, I, I know that there will be Republican support for a bonding bill that's passed. Uh, we need Republican votes, um, so there will be bipartisanship there. But most importantly, I think um, Minnesotans want us to get their work done. They want us to make decisions about our future. Um, and we're going to do that. And we're going to invite um, all the participation from everybody in the legislature, Democrats and Republicans. And I hope that people join so that we can make the best decisions going forward for the state of Minnesota. Madam Leader, thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time as always. Thanks for having me, Judy. Due to a scheduling conflict, we were unable to sit down with House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt. However, many of the questions we asked, he answered in a media forum. We'd like to air some of those responses for you at this time. Where do, what, what's your bonding bill look like? Maybe Representative Doubt can start. Um, you know, I think uh, my caucus is looking for a, a reasonable sized bonding bill, uh, and I think we're looking for something that is, uh, um, you know, uh, has a, a priority on uh, infrastructure, whether it be transportation infrastructure, uh, maybe HEPA projects in our higher education facilities, but uh, really, I think, heavy on, on infrastructure type stuff. Um, if we're getting a backlog and not taking care of the, the uh, infrastructure we have now, um, we probably should do that before we uh, worry about taking on new construction projects. Be before we go on, what's a reasonable sized bonding bill? Uh, you know, I think, just personally, I think my caucus would like to be at or below the, the biennial average, which I think is uh, right around a billion dollars for the last maybe 10 years. That's kind of been the average, I think. 
I think when you're talking about budget stability, you're in part, talking in part about a reserve fund that has not been increased since Arne Carlson was governor, and that uh, has been widely described by economic advisors as about half the size that it ought to be. Does uh, enlarging the reserve fit into anybody's priority? Uh, I think in the past we've we've had trouble making decisions on you know, what the right course is, and we've, you know, spent down reserves and spent out of the cash flow account, and we've borrowed money from schools, and um, frankly, I don't think any of those are real good solutions. Um, and, you know, if you ask me, I, I know that my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle here are going to say that it's because, you know, uh, we haven't been able to raise the taxes that we want to. Well, you know what, I, I think that if you look at the situation the state's in today, um, it, it's not because we raise taxes, as I said earlier. It's because Republicans over the last two years, or, or, or previous biennium, uh, made some of the difficult decisions to, to, you know, kind of correct some. And, and, and it's very easy if you look at the at the at the revenue versus the spending to see where the problem is. The problem's been on the spending side, not on the revenue side. So, um, and, and and right now we don't have a problem with revenue. We have a problem with spending. Um, and, and what we did this biennium is double down with you know four billion dollars of additional spending, about a ten percent increase, which you know Senator Han already said is absolutely unsustainable. Um, and all of this at a time. And, and now I hope I don't see anybody doing a, a victory lap about having a small surplus right now. That money belongs to the taxpayers. It's it's what what it means is that we've overtaxed Minnesotans, and for us to do some celebratory dance that we've got extra money in the state's budget right now, when Minnesota families haven't seen that money in their pocketbooks or in their family budgets, I think is the ultimate arrogance. Um, and, and and what we need to do is is make sure that we're watching out for those families first. Um, you know, I, I know everybody talks about the unemployment rate being uh, being low right now, which it is because Minnesotans have a great work ethic. But when they lost their jobs, they took a job at, at a lower wage or at a lower skill level. And 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 right now, 49% of Minnesotans are underemployed. That's a big number. 49% of Minnesotans are underemployed. So what we need to do is give the money that we took from Minnesotans that we didn't need back to them. How far are you willing to compromise on the minimum wage? Uh, increase and what potential hurdles would get in the way of a, an agreement here and how quickly do you want to try to act on that I think we all agree that we'd like to see you know lower and middle income Minnesotans making more money um, but you know this the solution to that problem is to create more better paying opportunities for Minnesota families um, and unfortunately this solution will create better paying opportunities but less of them um, and unfortunately, it's simply just not fair to the people that are going to lose their jobs. And even the Congressional Budget Office says that that's going to happen uh, if we do this. So uh, I think what we need is a more comprehensive solution that, that works for all Minnesotans. More, better paying opportunities. We, we need a, a, an environment here that attracts business creators and, and, and job creators into Minnesota to, to create those jobs. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.